ability to pick things that were worse than anything else. This is simply the common sorts of things that you would read in both the British and the American press at the time. Right. So we have British reports that primarily come from the Anglo-Armenian Anglo Association, which itself never identifies sources, or almost never. You have, in America, reports coming from uh, one journalist in, in uh, Istanbul, and pretty much everything else coming from Armenian sources. And even those, the missionaries, the reporters, also have things coming from Armenian sources. But that isn't enough. I needn't tell you, I hope, that there is an inherent difficulty in taking missionary sources and Armenian sources as the only thing you base your study on, the only thing upon which you base your knowledge. But it's not, it's not as simple as that. You also have such overwhelming prejudice, such overwhelming prejudice, that it's impossible to judge that anything that's written on these things is very accurate. Specifically, the traditional image of Turks. I've taken this from the United States, right? Rather than quote, rather than describe some illustrations. This, of course, this, of course, is an American minister, a guy named Cox, in Turkey. Notice the pictures. Notice the pictures here. This is Sultan Abdul Hamid II. Right? I needn't tell you, I think, that at the time, and unfortunately still today, there's a certain prejudice in my country against uh, people from Africa, whose ancestors are from Africa, or whose ancestors are from Asia. Look at the pictures of the Turks. Now, when you do that, you might look around yourself and see, does that look like Turks? But this is, of course, what is presented to Americans. And you have to remember, Americans had no concept of what Turks were like. No idea. They'd never seen or heard of a Turk in their life, and there weren't any movies or anything like that. But what this was was playing about all the prejudices you can imagine. Right? But that's just one example. Other examples. Right? This again is Sultan Abdul Hamid, and he's talking about what he did, or they're talking about what he did to the Turks. He's a standing disgrace. Notice what we have. We have a man, this is, this is the typical image of the Turk in the American news, a man with a mustache which I always think is rather attractive, but no. <laughs> a man with a mustache and a sword, or a, sort of a small scale scimitar, notice he's dragging fair Armenian maidens in before the Sultan, who's saying, oh, I'll take that one. He likes that. Right? Notice that next to him, next to him is a pile of human heads. Huh? But even stranger, next to him is also a bucket of champagne. Now, the strangest thing here, Sultan Abdul Hamid was a very pious Muslim. He didn't drink champagne. But I also think he probably didn't keep a pile of heads next to his throne. Right? And he also was, uh, well, he was, he was thin, too. This is the image. This is the image that was portrayed in America. Uh, the British newspapers didn't have nearly as many illustrations. America tended to go in for the graphic, then and now. This is from a book written by a missionary. I had a missionary who himself, of course, saw nothing. He wasn't in Turkey when this happened. This is a picture of Turkish soldiers lining up Armenian babies and shooting them. Huh? Now, I see some people shaking their heads. You don't think that happened? No, I don't think that happened at all. And in fact, no one saw anything like this. And just to demonstrate it, this is what Turks looked like in the same book. Huh? This is the grotesque dance of the pious dervishers. I think they mean der, uh, dervishes or dervish. But these are the pious dervishers. In other words, notice religious people. Look at the faces. Those aren't Turks. Those are monkeys. Huh? Notice the way they're dancing around. And of course, as Chef Kent and some others will realize here, that isn't really Ottoman at all. <laughs> it's just a fake script. Huh? Well, when people saw this sort of thing, what do you think they thought? Did they say, oh, that can't really be Turks who look like that. Turks are a noble, good-looking people. No, they said, oh, yeah, the Turks are really ugly. Huh? And they're exactly the kind of people, look at These are the kind of people who would lead to slaughter. They get out there, kill those people. Huh? This is the image. And it's an image that was deliberately portrayed, as a matter of fact. Those, that last set was missionary books. 
And missionary books were the ones that spread mostly in the United States, but there were some in Britain as well. When I say missionary books, it sounds like something you'd find in the back of a church and you know, not much. Tens of thousands, sometimes 50,000 copies of these books were sold in the United States. Huh? At the time, what was written by these missionaries was considered to be the closest thing to pornography, but it was pious pornography. Great emphasis on the slaughter of young virgins. Great emphasis on rape. Great emphasis on all the things you can just see people turning the pages going, oh, look at that, look at that. Huh? Great propaganda. This is the area we're talking about. This is the area that's, all, that's called Sassoon. And you can imagine, well, I'll tell you, the missionaries saw nothing. And one of the reasons they saw nothing was because of what this was like. This is just a map of altitude, and it doesn't really give you much of a feeling for what Sassoon was like. The thing I want to point out on here is, you see the road going along there. Huh? That is what's called a metal road at the time. That is a road that is sufficient to have a cart on it. Huh? You'll notice something else about the whole Sassoon region. Huh? There aren't any roads. There is no road that is big enough for a cart to travel on. The only roads that go into the district were roads that could be traveled by a donkey, a camel, or a person walking. And some of the roads, probably most of the roads actually, were too small even for an animal to pass. Roads that went up on the mountainside and only human beings could go on those roads. Now, why is that important? It's important because you've got to get news out of these places. Well, how do you do that? Huh? How do you do it? How do you find out what's going on? Because no Westerner, no missionary, no reporter is ever going to go down into those places, actually, until much after the fact, and then some did appear. Uh, to give you an idea of what the, it's really like, and hopefully this is, you can see this okay, this is uh, just a basic Google map of what, the, of what it actually looks like, uh, of what the region is like. We are not talking about any place that is easily transversed. This is, this is the area around Sassoon. This is the uh, Sassoon in Turkish today. Notice, and it, it's hard to get really the feeling for how craggy those mountains are. But nobody just walks over those mountains very readily. If you want to look at another, another area where there was revolt, Gelegizan, uh, same kind of thing. Uh, this is the region that we're talking about. This is the place from which all kinds of news came to Britain and the United States, and of course other places in Western Europe as well. Uh, they didn't get there. Nobody saw what was going on in that place in the beginning, but Kurds and Armenians, and a little later, Turkish soldiers as well. But that didn't keep them from reporting what went on. Because actually what was happening was, they were making it up. They simply were making up their stories and sending them back to Britain, France, Germany, and especially the United States. The reports that came from Sassoon, down there, came originally from reporters who were in Kars and in Julfa, in, on the border of uh, Iran and uh, in Azerbaijan. Huh? Those were the two areas the reports came from. Now, this isn't completely unusual, except for the fact that the reports came one day, supposedly, one day after the events that took place. Huh? One day. Some reports came on the same day the events supposedly took place. A fast horse, a fast donkey, somebody going along there, could travel from Sassu to Kars in seven days. Uh, and most a lot more than that. It took 10 days, if you were lucky, to get to Julfa. And some of the land you went across, you probably wouldn't get there at all. Uh, how did the reports appear? One day after the event, or sometimes the same day as the event. How could this have happened? It's easy. They made them up. They lied. That's all. There's no other way to do it. Uh, it can't be done. What actually happened was, uh, these people never got near the scene, but they sent their reports back. Right? 
In the 1890s, the Daily News, the London Times, and of course the newspapers in America that quoted them, uh, these never sent their reports from the area. The only reports they got, even the ones that were reported at a decent time, had to come from someone who said he knew what was going on, right? The only people they could have heard things from in Kars or in Julfa were Armenians. You can't believe the Turkish soldiers left that area, went up to Kars and said, oh, incidentally, we've killed a lot of Armenians. Huh? The only people they could have heard from at all were Armenians. Now that's important. So we have two sources that these people have. One source is Armenians, and the other source is their own imaginations. In fact, they kept on lying throughout the time. One of the reporters whose name I had on, uh, Dylan from the Daily Del Telegraph and Scudamore from the Daily News, they were never closer than Erzurum, never closer than Erzurum, but they sent their reports back with the byline, Mush. In other words, straight out lies. Now those lies still appear in the history books today as being reliable sources. It wasn't only Sasun. One of my favorites, which I've included, even though it isn't on Sasun, is the area of Hachin, which is an area that is right up, well, you know, uh, Suleimania, is that the, I'm trying to think of exactly where it is, but as you see, north of Marash in the, in the mountains above the Chukuro region. Right? Hachin reports were given by the newspapers starting in December of 1894. These reports stated that the town of Hachin had been destroyed by Turkish troops, and when they came in, they destroyed 1,700 wooden buildings. The Turkish troops came in and they burned all these wooden buildings to the ground so that the town was destroyed. There's only one small problem. Huh? If you can see it, this is a picture of Hachin. Huh? If you can take a close look at it, you'll notice something. And just to give you an even better indication, a really close look, huh? one of the buildings in the street. What do you see? There are no wooden buildings. Hachin, like the rest of, well, almost all the rest of Eastern Anatolia, is made out of mud brick. So how did the Turks burn down a wooden town? They didn't. It was all made up. But it's especially interesting that, remember these pictures I showed you, these pictures are of Hachin, which was supposedly burned down in 1894. These pictures were taken just before World War I. Hachin was still there. Would people in America, people in England, would they understand this? No, of course not. They didn't know Hachin from, uh, from uh, Peking. Out of an empire will know that they never talked about the Armenian provinces in any case. But these supposedly are official statistics. These statistics were in a, a book published, of course, by a missionary, the Reverend A. Williams. And uh, the Ottoman government gave no such figures. Completely invented. Huh? Numbers of Armenians starving, Armenians killed or starving. You'll notice if you take the number of Armenians killed or starving, you'd be forced to conclude that three-fourths of the Armenian population were killed or starving, huh? which would have been more even than anybody claims for World War I. And of course, it's completely invented. The Ottomans said no such thing. But there are even more of these. Unfortunately, this is very hard to read. But they're some of my favorite statistics. For instance, it says in the 59 districts of Harput, huh, there were 345 forced marriages, 473 rapes, 4,643 forced conversions, 340 people burned to death, 7,423 were killed. Huh? In Malazgirt, which you can see is down on the list there. In Malazgirt, supposedly three-fourths of the entire Armenian population was destroyed. Now, these figures came from a missionary, of course, who said he received them from, quote, a highly placed Muslim. <laughs> now, think about that. Think about where such statistics could have come from. Others, other statistics that were printed. In this case, these were ones, I believe, that came in the New York Times. Many others that are like this. Uh, notice, priest, this is one small area, of course, 
Preskilled 51, died from fever, 